Um, our next presenter, trying to stay on time here, is uh, Aran Gary. Uh, Aran is a global leader for IBM Engineering Lifecycle Solutions. He leads the engineering practices and solution architectures applying IBM ELM to industrial domains, mostly in aerospace and defense, automotive and medical devices. Aran's experience includes systems and software en engineering practices, engineering lifecycle management, model-based engineering, and product line engineering. His current focus is on implementing the digital engineering uh, and leveraging the OSLC standard. Um, Aran has over 25 years experience in the complex system domain. He was the principal architect of the Rhapsody MBSE product at IBM uh, after five years as an embedded systems developer in a defense company. Uh, he's an active member of the SysML v2 specification in the OMG. So um, Aran's going to be talking about OSLC linking profiles and some of the activities around that. So with that, I will uh, let Aran get started. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, Robert? Absolutely. I will be okay, quiet now. So hello, uh, everyone. Yeah, so in this uh, presentation, I'm more wearing the hat of a member of the OSLC Open Project. Uh, and by the way, we we forgot to mention in, in the beginning, I mean, Robert, we should have mentioned that we invite all the practitioners to, to join the OSLC, the OSLC Open Project. Definitely people like the uh, Drager can contribute a lot based on their experience. Uh, so we will. Uh, I will talk about the activity we are doing now at the OSC Open Project. Um, so just to set up the stage again, um, our goal and that aligns uh, to the st stronger today with the industry is to enable uh, what the industry calls today digital threats. Uh, the OSC when OSC started, that term did not exist, and the, that was way, way, way ahead of the industry. Um, and now as a, an evangelist of OSC, I definitely see around the, the need, and we saw it also in previous presentation for technologies to, to establish digital threads, at least of some sorts, across the engineering life cycle. Uh, here you see the definition, this is from Wikipedia. So digital threads are data-driven architecture that links together information generated from across the product life cycle, blah, blah, blah. And this is part of a very, even a bigger theme, which is called digital in the engineering, which is uh, evangelized very um, strongly by the, the uh, US Department of Defense, which is the, essentially the customer of the most complex systems that are being built. And therefore they, they saw the need to to shift to, to digital backbones and, and, and digital engineering, where digital threads is an important part of it. Uh, when we talk about digital threads, uh, and this certain perspective of it, maybe, um, uh, is there are some important things, which some of them we saw in the previous presentation. The, the basic one is the digital continuity is to establish uh, these digital relationships across the life cycle artifacts. Uh, the next one, which is also used is, uh, but it depends on the use case, is also to enable data exchange. Sometimes you need to also share data. It doesn't mean you just want to copy for copying, but you, you maybe you want to propagate parameters across to, to automate changes and so on. And uh, that's also, if you look at the complete implementation of the digital thread, it's an important capability, uh, which is supported by OSLC. By the way, people forget that OSLC is not a linking protocol. It, it offers uh, data vocabularies and enables uh, uh, fetching uh, data and, and setting data. Uh, next area is global configuration management. Uh, and this is the need to, to establish baselines across the, the life cycle and digital threads. We did see in the previous presentation some approach uh, uh, to do at least part of it. Um, and the, the next area is to enable analytics. And maybe if we be look at what was presented earlier, this is the sole idea of, of understanding the uh, 
uh, dependencies and, and understanding the life cycle graph. And, and once you have a life cycle graph, you can do lots of interesting uh, studies and analytics to, to optimize your engineering process. And the last one is, is to integrate uh, change change management into this entire process. So this is how we see the, the six foundation and uh, really the OSLC provides a good, good support for uh, all of those areas. In some stronger, in some there's, there's a, a room for improvement. Um, so what is what are OSLC profiles? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to. Um, so OSC profiles came to uh, to address uh, some practical gaps that we, we saw uh, around the utilization of practitioners of uh, OSC specifications, uh, especially the vendors. And I'm 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 wearing my IBM at uh, IBM at, at, that was uh, the you know pioneer of the OSC based applications, uh, we got lots of questions from, from different uh, practitioners that try to integrate, for example, IBM systems with other systems. And uh, uh, a main reason for, for um, requiring heavy, heavy support and, and depending on specific implementation or the implementation dependencies that the OSLC specification is very liberal. It recommends uh, lots of clauses, and uh, it allows for a high degree of, of uh, freedom in how you implement OSLC. And in the end, it results that unless you you are testing peer-to-peer two applications, you cannot guarantee that what you believe is an OSLC compliant application will indeed interoperate with another application because of those uh, variabilities that the spec supports. So OSC profiles, they come to close that gap. They, um, Uh, implementation of, uh, of of specification clauses that are either um, are not mandatory, are not musts, uh, and we say if you want to be compliant with this profile, you have to you have to implement those clauses. So the, the we we are significantly reducing the variability that you find in the original specs. And again, the idea is that if you follow the profile, the likelihood that you take two providers that follow the profile to, uh, to establish interoperability without having to modify them and start to look and, 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 and investigate the, the other, uh, the, the exact implementation of a provider is, is much, much higher. Um, so, so what you will see in the profiles is, is first you'll see tightening of of uh, specification clauses. Uh, and then you also see additional reference implementation, uh, ref reference uh, examples and, and reference documentation uh, in error. I guess we lost Aaron, anyone? Uh, yeah, I was just yeah. gonna interrupt here and say, uh, we looks like we have a couple technical difficulties here. Let's see if can, we can- Can you hear me now? Ah, there's Aaron, you're back. Uh, sorry, we are, I guess I need to share again. Share again and maybe maybe drop your video. Um, we, we, we love looking at you, but uh, maybe we have a little bit of bandwidth <laughs> issue. 
uh, dropping my video. Stop video. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for that. So now we go into into the first use cases. We, we use case that we decided we decided is the most fundamental in terms of OSC, and we saw it in previous presentation. This is what we call it, the linking profile. And the linking for profile comes to ensure interoperability for the most fundamental use case of, of linking. We have two, uh, two providers that are containers of resources and we want to establish links. Uh, and um, so, so this is what, what the linking profile focuses on is how we uh, tighten the specification and provide additional guidance that if you have a provider that wants to link with another provider, uh, there's no there's no ambiguities. Everything is 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 is, is uh, unambiguously specified to implement it. Now, also here, because of different levels of maturity and and usage of of OSC, we talk about three profiles that we are working on now and one futuristic. I, I will explain why it is more futuristic. Uh, and the first one is, is the basic profile, which is es essentially how we guarantee that two providers will establish con a connection and one provider can discover uh, uh, the, the links, uh, the, the resources to link to in another provider. That's, that's this is very basic. And, Based on our experience, we, we get lots of requests and support even to get to that point. Just establishing the connection, uh, getting, uh, for example, a, a, re a resource speaker and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but this is today even a major hurdle unless you get lots of support from for the, the application, the vendor of the application. Uh, the next level is what we call bidirectional. Uh, bidirectional comes to uh, uh, is, is an enhanced use case where we we're not only interested to establish a link from one provider to the other is 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 also to make sure that both sides both applications are aware of the link so you can navigate both directions and and the link is is as always as is link supposed to be uh, you you can see the link on both ends and and you can navigate the link on on both ends that requires some additional conventions that we, we, you will see. Uh, the next level, uh, this is what we call configuration aware linking. Uh, this is how you link with providers uh, that supports the OSSC global configuration, uh, uh, which is requires um, more attention. There's more, uh, more, more, more considerations that you have to take into account as you, we will see. And then, the, the future one is what we call optimized linking. I, I will explain it later. It has to do with optimization of link discoveries. And that's, that's supposed to uh, assume that we, uh, we will extend the standard uh, to, to, uh, to support the discovery of a link service, which currently is not the case. Therefore, this is why we say it's future because First, we need the standard to be extended to enable that profile. Do um, you still hear me? I'm, I'm okay. Or, okay. We can still hear you. Keep going. Okay. You're going good. Okay. So, so here you see what I described, and and once we talk about the profile, we identified capability areas, uh, which correspond to the key clauses in the OSSC specifications, where. Um, each one of these capabilities is needed. And you can see across the different profiles, the profiles are the columns. So for example, in a basic profile, we essentially require things like authentication, um, establishing the connection. And, and for example, uh, uh, should be, uh, that you should be able to, uh, to, to uh, get, uh, for example, a selection dialogue. Um, and as you, as you can see, if you, if you look at the profile, for each one of those capabilities, uh, the relevancy grows as we go to a more advanced uh, profile. So for bidirectional uh, uh, linking, you need to be able to do 
at least according to 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 our uh, what we believe is is the right architecture is is uh, to do a link discovery and 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 so on. So you you can see that that more more, more and more capabilities are are required as we go to more advanced use cases. For uh, the most basic one, uh, the less capabilities uh, that are are, are required basically. Um, so some of those capabilities that tell you what they are and what, what, where we are today, one of the confusing area is, is, is the, this pattern of using root services document. Uh, this is something that is used by, for example, the ELM uh, applications and uh, um, uh, but not only, we, we, we found some other applications that use this pattern of root services document. Uh, which you can think of discovery uh, of discovery that creates lots of confusion about how, for example, to uh, to deal with the, the the IBM ELM tools at least. Uh, we thought it would be good to uh, to to add to the profile all the explanation of, of how to deal with applications that have root services uh, documents from which you can do, uh, find useful information. And most useful in terms of OSLC is how, how you find the, the service provider catalog. So this, this gives you the access to the service provider catalog, which is standard in OSLC. But first, in order to get there, you, you need to go through the root services document, which is kind of a, until now was, was an IBM proprietary thing. So this is an example for one thing that would be in the profile. Uh, the next area is a bunch of capabilities around uh, security, um, uh, uh, starting from mandating HTTPS that we found that was not mandated and we found that practically uh, uh, if you don't support HTTPS, it's it's usually a, a blocker. Uh, going to clari clarification and, and tightening uh, the uh, requirements around the uh, authentication using on OAUS, OIDC, and so on, uh, that uh, is a source of, of confusion. Uh, and then some other security uh, things like the content security police policy uh, to uh, to to enable, for example, web clients to to show content uh, from other uh, applications. Sometimes suddenly you don't see. Uh, Delegated UI from OSFC because uh, the content security policy was not clear, was not set up properly. Uh, and another something similar is 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 the the, the uh, cross origin resource sharing, what called CORS. Uh, this was also an area of confusion uh, that was needed to, to seamless operation of 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 a delegated UI in web clients that talk to OSC providers. So, so these are all security related things that causes confusion and we will tighten them down and create all the clarification needed. So, um, so uh, providers can, can establish a connection without having to juggle around too much. Um, selection dialogue. I mean, this is this is the canonical way to uh, we believe to establish links across providers. It's not the only way. There are we are we know some implementations like we saw earlier that, uh, for example, use queries and they they query the other provider and they provide some local API. Uh, but this is this is a standard service. Uh, we believe it's 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 the right way to uh, to inspect resources from another provider because the provider knows how to present the resource to you to the resource to you in an optimal way so here we see a, a delegated ui coming from a, for example the doors ng that shows you the requirements that you can link to and it, it would show it to you in the way it looks like in doors ng so so and, and we believe that every provider knows best how to present its own local resources so this is why we believe that this needs to be implement needs to be implemented to uh, to enable a good interoperability to, to establish links. So those those uh, capabilities were all related to the very basic profile to establish a connection and be able to select. After that, we the next one is is more bidirectional. 
so bidirectional linking, uh, he comes to all kinds of issues, is where are we storing the link? I mean, one way, and, and it, it, it was it used to be a practice and, and still practice somewhere, is to um, store the link on both sides. We saw another implementation today that is storing the link in, in a special server. Uh, but the canonical, the recommended way, um, but at least by the profile and what as we also practice in, in IBM is, 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 is to store the link on one side, which is what we call the, the outgoing side. And that will be defined, will be defined more precisely in the profile and then have the other side uh, inquire for the link. This is what we call incoming link discovery. And that completely avoids uh, all kind of uh, data inconsistency because if you store link in multiple places, especially if you have configurations, then it can be a mess that suddenly the link is uh, exists on one side, does not exist on the other side, or if you delete, you have to delete on this side, on the other side, and now, once you also factor in configurations, it, it becomes very complicated. So storing the link on one side uh, uh, simplifies all those inconsistencies. And in this part of the profile, we, we will explain how we, what is the policy we recommend, where the link should be stored, how the other party that does not store the link as you see here in the picture should inquire for the link. And that will be all um, well defined in a way that um, uh, at least, let's say, if, if you would uh, interoperate, uh, let's say, with with with, with an, uh, an ELM application from IBM, uh, you you you'll not get confused, or you'll not confuse the ELM application, for example. But again, we believe that this is a good pattern uh, to to uh, manage bidirectional linking across OLC providers. Uh, the next one is um, configuration management that we're linking. Uh, here we get into the business of what happens if, if your uh, providers have multiple configurations. And here we see a requirement, which we call requirement 101, and uh, some model elements from let's say a CSML model, which is called engine. Uh, the conceptual, usually in OSC, we talk about conceptual link. So the conceptual link would say the engine is linked with requirement 101. But what happens is that as the system ev evolves, requirement 101 can have version two and version three. And the question is what happens with the link? Yeah, are we always looking at the, the same? I, ideally, we want the link to be uh, resolved. And we also saw in the first, uh, presentation that there was, they introduced the concept of re resolving link. They call it symbolic links. Uh, we call them concept links in OSC. Uh, so the whole business of linking in the, in the, in the context of configuration management uh, is, is around how, how to use, uh, how to, to, to approach a linking scenario in the presence of a configuration management based provider how links are getting resolved, how we factor in the configuration as a context for resolving links and, and so on. So um, this is, this is the, a more advanced use case, but at least if you, you work against the IBM ELM, uh, you have to understand it because ELM typically uh, and uh, promotes the usage of configuration management. Uh, you can still use, for example, ELM application as, as flat containers without configurations, but uh, this is becoming more and more scarce these days. Um, the last one is maybe one word about the, this is the futuristic thing. So, um, and this is something we implemented in ELM and, and we, we wanted to standardize it. Uh, and this has to do along the previous theme of how we discover incoming links. This all relies on the fact that we don't store links on both sides because this becomes messy. Now, what I said earlier that on the basic thing, the way you discover incoming links, you can query uh, the other provider for the incoming links. But we found that querying uh, all the other providers is not, does not scale well. So what you can see here, we have five providers. 
Uh, there are links across the providers which are stored. You can see the, let's say, assume on the origin of the link. So the question is how the other provider can, can, can discover the link. So the basic way is you can, you, can, you can basically inquire each one of the other providers, do you have a link pointing to me? But we found that it's not very scalable. So uh, there is this notion of uh, a link index service, uh, which maintains a central link index for rapid uh, discovery of incoming links. Uh, the link index service is getting updated by TRS feeds. And this is sort of a live index. It's not the master data because it will be reestablished. The master data is the links which are stored with the providers. But uh, the, uh, the link in the services, you can think about it as so, sort of a live cache of index that helps to, uh, uh, to discover incoming links. Now, we need to standardize it. It's not standardized. When we standardize the idea of link index service, um, we will extend the profile to take it into account as what we call the, the optimized profile. Um, and last one, uh, some activities, future activities that related to that, that we do in the OSFC OPIC project. So I, I mentioned the standardizing the link index service. Uh, we also are in discussion to standardize link validity uh, service. And we saw in the first presentation that they actually um, found link validity very important and they implemented it on their own. So we hope at least to interact with the Drago team along those lines to, to see how we can do a good job on standardizing it. Um, and then uh, we have some completion related to, um, to the global configuration spec uh, has to do with, with, with things like uh, delivering chain set and so on. This is not directly related, but those are kind, kind of low hanging fruits that we, we discussed in the OSCC uh, open. Um, Group again. I invite you, especially practitioners that we select Drager to 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 join. Uh, we have a weekly meeting and contribute, especially if you see the, the the topics that we we are working on. I'm sure you have uh, a lot to contribute. Again, our vision is in the future to base all this interoperability based on open standards. So, I. And I will wrap up here. I think there are a couple of minutes for questions. If there are any questions. Hi, Iran. Uh, thanks for thanks for taking the time and walking us through what's going on with profiles and the value of that. I think we saw from the first presentation why something like standardizing the link validity service is is so important. Um, and and definitely uh, the experience in the community is what we need to have within that standards group. Um, now. Uh, we do have a, a couple questions here. I think I think uh, David was, uh, Honey was looking to be able to answer that, but uh, I just want to make sure that you have a chance to be able to talk about it as well. One of the questions was uh, and was on how you're storing links on the canonical side, um, and the question was basically why are you doing that more? What is it? Is it detailing a purpose, or is it uh, the how do, how do you determine the ownership? Is that kind of process based or is that tooling based? Can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, I mean, from from the profile perspective, we we definitely need to 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 specify how you determine the ownership. Now, the way we would do it, maybe some others will 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 have different opinions, but in order to stop the ambiguity, uh, we will precisely define who owns the link. Now, the intuition behind who owns the link is, is, um, if, uh, is, is um, if you look at the, every link, if you look at the, the semantics of the link, that there has some sort of a, uh, an origin and, and, and an outgoing node and node and incoming node. So if you look at link for like a satisfy, for example, so the, the satisfying, or satisfy the satisfying node is sort of the origin. It's like if you, when you look at dependencies, there's always one side which is the origin, one side which is sort of the target. So um, that's the intuition behind it, the, uh, that the, the dependent node or the dependent resource 
he is the one that, that owns the link. Uh, but that said, if you if you look, so typically if you look at the requirements, typically the other providers are not the requirements application would own the link because the requirements are usually sort of an upstream thing that all the others depend on. But this is why we have the bidirectional that when you, if you look at the requirements application, as a user, you don't care what the link is stored. So I want to emphasize it. In terms of implementation, we need that someone stores the link, but as a user, you shouldn't care. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I, I, I think you did. I think you did. Um, I, I think that, that um, there's probably some more dialogue there in terms of uh, whether or not the user cares where it's stored. Um, I think it needs to be, it, that's probably a discussion that we can carry on elsewhere. I, I understand that the, the notion of, of it needs to be transparent to the users that things happen the way they expect it to. Um, and, and knowing where that store is actually probably valuable to them. Um, but, but being able to navigate those links, it doesn't matter to the user where it was stored. They just want to be able to navigate. Yeah, correct. Um, so, so that, that's, that's us being OSLC geeks and diving into the details. But um, Aron, thank you so much for presenting.